I'm first going to introduce um, our ESI speaker of the day, and this is Amelia Dietman, and she um, is essentially has a PhD in pharmaceutical sciences, and then really followed a very typical research path here at UCSF, had a T32, the clinical pharmacology T32, then got a K-12, then got a K-23 in the midst of that um, right now. But actually what she works on uh, is um, through multiple studies through the ACTG, works on reservoir measurement, but is fundamentally the tissue levels of antiretrovirals that would um, influence uh, those measurements, which is how her talk will relate to Dr. Gupta's, and then um, now actually co-directs the drug research unit. Uh, and so we're very excited to hear about her talk that will lead up to Dr. Gupta's talk. So thank you so much. So yeah, so I have a very general title, Defining Drug Action for HIV Cure, and I'm just going to talk really broadly of eight minutes about um, what we're doing in my research program and kind of what we're building here at UCSF. So I used to have different pictures of where we all are. Now we're all in Pride Hall. And so we have the clinical folks, the DEM and Tim's lab and everybody else and Rachel and then the drug research unit, um, we're on the second floor. Um, so when I came here five years ago, I, in terms of, uh, to this group, I, you know, really saw a lot of great work being done at the intersection of virology and immunology to understand how, you know, viral reservoirs are established and persist. Um, but I didn't really see so much about like pharmacology and how people, um, you know, what are the PK of some of these agents and people with HIV and how are they impacting reservoirs and how does that relate to drug susceptibility and viral escape mutations and really ultimately kind of normalizing immune dysfunction and getting some anti-HIV capacity um, towards functional cure. And so I um, have kind of crafted this program over the last five years, really implementing more PKPD, which I'll go into more approaches specific to cure um, in existing trials, and then measuring tissue level exposure response. And then also more recently, thinking more about integrative kind of multimodal analyses and multimodal being virology, immunology, pharmacology, and really outcomes data as well. Um, and so this is the, the age old sort of uh, PKPD figure. So you have essentially uh, drug exposure is the concentration over time, which isn't that much meaningful without kind of understanding how that concentration relates to effect and then how that relates to whatever effect you would like to see over time. And so I edited this for HIV cure. And so really our agents, so the exposure and their effect and kind of hopefully decreasing viral reservoirs decreasing immune dysfunction and potentiating good um, positive and HIV um, immune function and really towards functional cure. And those outcomes really have become kind of decreased set point, delayed time to rebound, latency reversal, and really post-treatment control. So just diving right in. So the first uh, kind of applying PKPD approaches. So this is something that you may have seen Michael and Rachel present before. So looking at kind of a, a clinical trial, um, the AMFAR study, um, and thinking and kind of oh, the viral uh, rebound over time um, following ATI. And these are the BNAB, plasma BNAB levels, kind of understanding, okay, how is, um, you know, the BNAB exposure relating to time to rebound, but also how is the post rebound dynamics, you know, how is the BNAB washout for some of these individuals that still have BNAB on board relating to, you know, overlapping with that immune modulation that is, is occurring. And then, um, you know, how is viral susceptibility coming into that too? So this is really the classical PKPD analysis, and this is using nonlinear mixed effects modeling. And my postdoc Hari is really um, kind of spearheading this work with us. Um, and then, you know, also updating those models as we get new findings. So we meet every week, you know, and Rachel kind of brings to the table immunology data and other collaborators bring virology data um, and kind of in updating that to understand mechanisms, but also to understand what's really driving these treatment responses. The second um, fold of this is really characterizing tissue exposure response. And so I got, I just have the great pleasure to um, have access to the data from Tim and um, Henry um, Van Brocklin's uh, PET imaging, so a VRCO1, which is a HIV specific BNAB. And so they have done PET imaging studies and viremic art and uninfected individuals. And so really, um, you know, we started just analyzing that data. This is the exposure 
um, overall uh, across tissues of interest. And then you can see this is on a log scale. So you have kind of like liver up here. And then in the next quadrant, there's a lot of other tissues. And then there are some tissues over here. I can't see very well, but it's usually like lymph nodes um, and more of the cerebral and brain sites that are having just way lower exposure than blood and liver and all these other areas that are just more highly perfused. And so um, in addition to that, we're developing, and I'll, my next slide is an example of kind of how we're taking this to the next step. But um, in addition to that, my group is developing BNAB tissue assays. So we just started this. Um, a lot of BNABs are quantified using ELISA and only in plasma, and there aren't validated assays for tissue. So we really want to understand how much BNABs are getting in the tissues from these studies. Um, and we really need to develop novel methodologies with LCMSMS um, to do this. And so nobody's really ever done this quantitatively for any antibody for that matter, because it's just highly technical. And so we're working on that. And my whole group is really involved in that. And then um, Hari, who I also showed on the last slide, is also working on the postmortem tissue analysis um, from a cohort um, here at the general um, of people who have died from sudden cardiac death and um, looking at intracellular tenofovir and FTC um, concentrations in tissue. We also have assays and PBMCs and you can do 1 million PBMCs and you get both intracellular tenofovir and FTC. Um, and so um, that's a big piece of what we're doing during these studies, but also during ATI studies that, that we're involved in. So how are we kind of taking that PET data and taking it to the next level? Danny Chu, who's in the back here is a master's student in epidemiology. And he has really taken this and we've used the AMP trial data from the BRCO1 AMP trials for prevention. And they had a relationship between the, preve the uh, preventative e efficacy in plasma and how that concentration related to the IC80. So that's what this PT80 measure is. So this is the plasma curve. And they said, okay, you need about a hundred fold um, level to kind of reach this you know, 80 or 90% efficacy. And so we looked at using the PET data, kind of how would that scale to look at gut concentrations? And so we looked at colon concentrations as like kind of the surrogate side of potential infection. And so, um, you know, and you can see that this is the, the um, upper and lower based on the PET data and then the median. And so this gets shifted um, down more towards what you would expect, which would be like a one-to-one -one ratio. And so kind of understanding where all of these different tissues lie. And next, Danny is going to be kind of scaling this PET model because these are using micro doses up to therapeutic doses and really understanding how that would predict AMP data and predict protect protective efficacy. And all of this is really in the name of trying to explore how we can use early PET studies and animals or humans to inform BNAB drug development for PrEP, ART, or CURE um, across tissues. And then lastly, something I've been thinking about a lot recently um, with Tim and Rachel um, and many others is really integrative multimodal analyses of um, you know, viral, immunological, and pharmacology data. So early on, I had the chance to contribute to this study, which was a study of arabolimus. Um, and people in HIV who had received organ transplants. Um, and what the overall study didn't show any effect of a ravolimus on um, tissue or uh, on um, uh, HIV RNA reservoirs. But um, if you looked at just people that had higher levels of a you saw actually a significant decrease over the period of time. And then when you incorporated the levels into your RNA seq analysis, you saw similar si signals like mTOR signaling that were popping up for kind of the overall endpoints as well. And so kind of making the link between the clinical and the mechanistic um, all the way around and the pharmacology. And so, and then uh, last year I was starting to really look at this paper, which is the Zika paper from Rachel um, and uh, uh, I think Matt Spitzer's group um, looking at kind of different um, modules of immune features that are related to kind of different responses post Zika and post Zika exposure. And I really started thinking about kind of how can we incorporate drug levels into more of these cluster analyses. And so we're starting to do this for the A5337 study with serolimus, but also um, uh, other clinical studies. We have access to this data and kind of incorporating, okay, how can we 
kind of define response phenotypes to drugs based on drug level and not just exposure to the agent. And so I think this is kind of the future and we have a computational cluster to support this as well. And so with that, I have just the best job and I work with amazing people and I'm supported by just so many people. So Tim's lab, our group at the DRU, my co-director, Lu Shang Wang, who's not here today, um, and then my many other collaborators and funders and all of you at CIFAR, it's just a pleasure to work with all of you. And with that, I guess I don't take any questions now, Lauren, or, okay, I take questions. <laughs> or do I just like run into, I'm, did I meet the time limit or did I? <laughs> I try to talk as fast as Tim. <laughs> this is my goal. You can tell who your mentors are. <laughs> hey, Michael. Yeah, so uh, Amelia, um, great work and it's amazing working with your group. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of just speak a little bit um, to some of the like what you see is the key questions in the field of HIV pharmacology related to BNABs and cure, just as like a broad framing for this group who um, might not be as enmeshed in those issues. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And of course, amazing to work with you and everyone as well. So I, um, I think, um, you know, understanding kind of how BNABs are actually working, there's really no way to get at that question unless you really understand what is the exposure in tissue. And I didn't show it here, but you know, like, I hope we can really understand like BNAB complexes and you know, how that's invoking an immune response and that technology and that, you know, methodology and thinking doesn't really exist because there's not enough pharmacologists in this space in groups like this that can like talk to one another and work so closely together. And so um, I think we're gonna be really uniquely to kind of answer questions about BNAB action and vaccinal effects and virology and um, really relate that to outcomes. And that's gonna have impacts, not just on cure, but on prevention and art use of BNABs too. Hey, Monica. talk, but it's about tissue levels. Like, do you think that tissue levels matter for prep drugs versus, um, you know, systemic levels? And the reason this keeps on coming up is with doxy now is going the same way as um, what happened with original TDFFTC prep in women that everyone's thinking the sort of covaginal versus rectal levels matter. And I don't, I don't think they do. I think they don't, but I don't know what, what you think about that. Yeah. In terms of like the link to like efficacy. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's, so one thing, just like a general pharmacology concept, which, you know, of course, but it's like the, if the plasma levels and the tissue levels are just running directly in parallel, like you don't need to be measuring all the tissue levels. Like you can make a good correlation to the efficacy based on the plasma levels. But if you don't know that, <laughs> Like you need to kind of study it in some way. And it would be nice to do it in a non-invasive way where we don't have to be like collecting all these gut biopsies like PET or something where we can just like micro tracer it or, but you have to validate that. Um, and so I think it's important. Um, it could be important, but um, the one thing about BNABs is their distribution is just so different than small molecules. So small molecules are just much more freely moving around. BNAPs have a totally different elimination pathway. Their um, elimination is exposure dependent. So like at much smaller doses, you're having a lot of target mediated um, elimination and at much higher levels, it's really more lymphatic system and kind of like bulk elimination from the cells. Um, and so that I think those in between spaces, it's gonna matter, but of course that's relative to susceptibility and resistance and um, development and things. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, um, without further ado, Ravi Gupta is a professor of clinical, are you guys going to change? Oh, perfect. It's here. Okay. Um, Ravi Gupta is a professor of clinical microbiology at Cambridge university. He's worked in HIV resistance and the molecular and population levels and, uh, worked with the WHO to change treatment guidelines for HIV he was involved with the London patient and demonstrating the eradication in him. And then um, 
Uh, it was the second recorded cure in history. And then of course, during COVID-19, he used his expertise to um, map the RNA virus genetics um, and biology and uh, re that are likely to arise in immunocompromised individuals. And then he reported real world data on viral escape responses. Um, there's just so much here, Ravi. And then, <laughs> um, uh, but in all in all, he advised the UK government on the COVID-19 uh, through trials. And then uh, in 2020, he was on the top 100 list of most influential people by time uh, with Tony Fauci. So he's super, this is super cool. And in 2022, it was featured on the Clavarant list of uh, world's most highly cited scientists. So I have no business preceding you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's it was such a nice introduction, and it's great to be here. And um, uh, lovely to see all of you. Um, and I can see the weather has welcomed me in the same way to make me feel at home, <laughs> nice and wet. Um, the, but I'm glad I got yesterday. It was a lovely day, um, and it's good to be here. So um, we've spent, uh, of course, worked in drug resistance and, and HIV virology for a long time. Um, but we got um, interested in uh, virus uh, cell interactions early on. Um, mainly because I was um, doing work on drug resistance, but uh, we were sharing lab space with Greg Towers and his lab was into virus restriction factors. Um, and I found that much more interesting than what I was doing. So I kind of um, did my PhD on two different things. And one of the things was on um, uh, tethering, which is a host restriction factor. So it kind of started me on this sort of trajectory of being interested in, in, in cellular biology as well as um, virology. And I think that's been really useful um, as time has gone on. Um, so... Uh, Tom Hope gave me the slide, um, so I have to acknowledge him. But of course, uh, the, 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 we've become interested in, in, in macrophages uh, as, as innate immune cells, uh, uh, leading on from that early work on tethering, for example. And, and then, you know, we got interested in this question of, of, of what the relevant reservoirs are, of course, and, 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 and cells that express CD4 and CCR5 are, are many. Um, some of them are here. Uh, and of course, all the, uh, the attention really has been focused around um, CD4 T cells. I know that Tom is interested in mast cells at the moment, um, um, but um, of course macrophages are up there and, uh, uh, and we're not very popular for, for a long time in terms of um, being bona fide reservoirs. Um, where are macrophages found? Well, we all know that there are many, many different flavors of macrophages. They perform homeostatic um, functions. Um, uh, of course, in, they mediate inflammation, tissue repair, uh, uh, and numerous other functions. So of course, big sites of macrophage uh, populations include uh, lymph nodes, spleen, uh, the gut, um, and of course the central nervous system. And uh, in terms of clinical relevance, uh, we've been interested in, um, in, 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 in presence of virus and CSF uh, 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 in regards to escape, uh, both in the UK and in South Africa where we work. And so macrophages um, of, of, of many different flavors there, of course, you have perivascular macrophages, microglial cells, um, uh, uh, so a number of potential targets. Uh, so just in terms of what the sort of data are for the relevance of macrophages, I mean, that, that one of the very nice papers that I, um, uh, uh, that I wanted to mention was this work from Victor Garcia's lab, uh, where they took BLT mice and um, managed to deplete T cells. So these, these mice only did not have T cells and they were able to infect with, uh, with HIV-1. Uh, and you could see a viremia there, you know, sort of, um, uh, 10 to the 5, uh, and this could be suppressed with the antiretroviral therapy in the gray box there. And then, of course, you, you got a rebound as soon as you, um, soon after interruption. So this is, was, was quite a nice study suggesting that uh, macrophages could be uh, reservoirs and lead to productive infection. Um, what about humans? Um, uh, well, uh, there's a figure from Steve Uckel's um, paper from 2014 there, where they were looking at rectal tissue and, um, and saw uh, HIV DNA in, in myeloid cells as well as T cells. Um, there's a more recent paper here from, uh, uh, from a group looking at um, penile tissue from uh, people living with HIV who underwent gender reassignment surgery, and they took uh, macrophages and T cells from those, um, uh, those um, uh, foreskin um, uh, samples and, um, and uh, looked for integrated HIV and found quite reasonable levels in macrophages in a limited number of donors. Um, but they didn't find HIV in T cells. Um, more recently, of course, there's this nice, very nice paper from Janice Clements, um, who's been working on macrophage reservoirs for a long time. 
uh, mainly in um, in animal models or, or, or primate models, but this paper was uh, uh, mainly uh, around humans, and they were able to use um, uh, a modified IPDA assay, which is the intact proviral DNA assay, uh, and they applied this to uh, to monocytes circulating the blood, and you can see that there are um, uh, uh, that th there are detectable. Uh, intact uh, full-length copies of HIV DNA and mon circulating monocytes in a proportion of individuals. Um, it's obviously lower than, than, than T cells, although that didn't reach statistical significance. What was nice is that they then um, did a sort of modified QVOA, which is a viral outgrowth assay. So co-culturing those macrophages and stimulating them um, uh, and spinoculating uh, uh, cells um, uh, with, uh, with them. Uh, to facilitate virus outgrowth. And you can see that in each case, you get some virus outgrowth there. Some cases you don't. Um, but the phylogeny is interesting because the macrophage, so the MDM associated um, uh, lineages um, kind of uh, in, uh, are, are intermingled with, um, with, with uh, viruses isolated from CD4 T cells. So, so, so this suggests that the virus that's coming out of macrophages is related to, to, to that within T cells and, and it's replication competent. So um, just in terms of what the clinical relevance of all this is, um, I mentioned the central nervous system. We've been interested in, uh, to some extent in, in virus escape. And there's a long history of research in certainly the US on, on uh, CNS escape. Uh, and, it, and CSF discordance probably occurs in less than one in 10 individuals. Um, uh, and can present with very broad uh, symptomatology, such as difficulty concentrating, of course, depression and low mood. Um, uh, so it makes it very difficult to make a diagnosis of what the cause is really. Um, we've been looking at this in South Africa and it seems to be quite uncommon and to similar prevalence as uh, observed here. But, um, but of course we are then interested in, in, in what role macrophages are playing there. So just to, the sort of main body of my talk actually is, is not clinical really, it's, it's actually coming from the molecular side um, uh, and goes back to our work on rest host uh, restriction factors. This is a slightly complex slide of, uh, of a retrovirus and the various um, stages of um, uh, the, the virus can be blocked by um, host proteins, including TRIM5, APBEX, you have SAMHD1, which we'll talk about today. Um, these are all acting early at the RT step or pre-integration step. Um, uh, uh, and, and then, of course, you have uh, factors that are acting uh, to prevent virus release uh, at the other end. <clears throat> so we, we got interested in SAMHD1 when it was um, uh, its role in antiviral restriction was described in. Uh, do we need to do we need to remove that uh, thing up there or not? Okay. Um, SAMHD1 is actually a host protein. It's a, a DNTP hydrolase. In other words, it takes DNTP and, and breaks it up. Uh, in, uh, uh, and uh, it's therefore involved in cell cycle. Uh, so when a cell is about to divide, it will um, uh, switch off SAMHD1 so that um, nucleotides can accumulate. And of course, cells do not want to have high levels of DNTPs hanging around because that's um, food for uh, DNA viruses in particular and retroviruses. So they wanna keep DNTB levels controlled. And that's why SAMHD1 is switched on and hydrolyzes when a cell is um, non-dividing. In other words, when it's quiescent. So this uh, keeps, uh, helps to keep tight control in nucleotide levels. Of course, this has implications um, because when a cell is cycling, uh, as you can see in the middle there, um, uh, so if SAMHD1 is, 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 is active, it will block HIV um, uh, because it's hydrolyzing uh, nucleotides and the nucleotide levels are low. When the cells are arrested, um, uh, uh, HIV1 uh, is, 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 is blocked. So this is a rather elegant system for, 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 um, for, for regulating nucleotide levels that's been, um, that, that viruses have to overcome somehow. So in terms of how HIV um, or immunodeficiency viruses overcome uh, SAMHD1. It's very interesting because um, SAM was uh, described as a, a restriction factor in the context of HIV2 and SIV viruses, which encode a VPX protein. And this is a very short protein that uh, specifically can target SAMHD1 for destruction in the, um, uh, uh, using the, you, you, in the proteasome uh, via ubiquit ubiquitination. HIV1, of course, doesn't have a VPX protein. So the big question has been, um, how does HIV get um, uh, perform you know, the same function in terms of evading SAMHD1 uh, without, an, without a specific antagonist? 
Um, and 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 so some of our early work uh, uh, on this um, revealed that we can actually switch off some HD1 or toggle it um, uh, uh, in macrophages, in primary macrophages, just by changing the serum that we use to culture the macrophages. Traditionally, most labs use human serum uh, to culture macrophages, but some use FCS. And people thought this was quite equivalent uh, for many years. We actually showed that if you use fetal calf serum to uh, to culture your macrophages and, and mature them from monocytes into um, uh, monocyte derived macrophages, uh, and if you use FCS, you actually drive them into the cell cycle. You can see the stem here shows you that um, uh, uh, the cell cycle associated proteins are upregulated. Um, this is a, a sort of schematic of the cell cycle. Most macrophages are sitting in G0. Uh, and they will enter um, uh, uh, G1 growth phase and then S phase. Uh, and some macrophages can then go on to divide, especially those which are yolk sac derived. Most macrophages don't proliferate generally um, and, uh, uh, and, and can move between cell cycle states. And so we showed here that if you stimulated them, many of them went into a high proportion went into G1 represented by this marker MCM2. Uh, and that was very, very significant. Uh, if you do RNA, um, bulk RNA-seq, you can then see um, upregulation of transcripts associated with cell cycles such as cyclin D, CDK1, CDK6, and, and a whole bunch of others. So, um, so quite a strong stimulus just by changing the culture media. Um, when you do the Western blots, you can see that this correlates very nicely. You've got upregulation of cyclins here um, and CDKs in stimulated um, macrophages. Uh, and this is consistent with activation of the canonical um, uh, mitogen um, pathway that involves MEK, ERK, um, the cyclin D associated with CDK4, uh, and this leads to um, a regulation of transcription factors, uh, uh, which then culminates in expression of various cyclins uh, at the other end, including CDK1. And of note, CDK1 was described already as the protein which regulates SAMHD1. So uh, changing CDK1 levels uh, enables, uh, or, or upregulating CDK leads to phosphorylation of SAMHD1, and when you phosphorylate SAMHD1, uh, you, um, uh, you essentially deactivate it. In other words, uh, it allows high DNTP levels to accumulate in the cell so that the cell can divide. So this is all part of the proliferation pathway. So um, we knew that, of course, uh, SAMHD1 regulates HIV infection at reverse transcription. Um, and we set out to show this in our system so we can take SAMHD1 knockout um, mouse uh, mice, take their peritoneal macrophages, and here we use a GFP virus, a GFP lentivirus um, that's, gre that's green here. And you can see each of these peaks is an infected cell. We're using high throughput microscopy to count the cells. Um, and you can see each of the green peaks of infection current coincides with a cell that is expressing MCM2, which is a marker of cell cycle entry. Uh, so it's expressed everywhere from G1 onwards, right through to cell division. So each of these co peaks corresponds, set telling you that the virus is only able to infect cells which are in the cell cycle. And um, that's where you get a very near perfect correlation between infected cells and cycling cells. If you remove some HD1, uh, this, is, this was done by CRISPR uh, in the mice, um, then uh, you get infected cells um, uh, that do not correlate with MCM2. In other words, the, the cells become infected regardless of whether the cells are expressing um, uh, uh, MCM2. Uh, in other words, they are cell cycle independent. And that's consistent with the fact that you've removed the restriction factor and therefore the virus no longer cares about which stage of the cell cycle um, you're in. So that's um, showing that there's a role for SAMHD1 in blocking a very potent blockade of, of lentivirus in, in monocyte derived macrophages. So that was an artificial system. We, we gave them you know, this boost by using fetal calf serum, but what about in vivo? How might this occur in vivo? So um, we had an idea that uh, maybe cell contact was important. Um, and so we, we did a series of experiments where we took macrophages uh, from, uh, monocyte derived macrophages from, uh, from donors. We co-cultured autologous um, CD4 positive T cells from those individuals. And then we, put, um, um, we um, cultured them together essentially. And what we found is quite interesting. So here is a macrophage. They look like pancake, uh, sort of fried eggs. And then you have your, T the, your CD4 T cells on the outside here. And we found that um, if you co-cultured them, then you, um, you upregulated uh, MCM2, the cell cyclist um, marker that I showed you earlier, also CDK1, suggesting that these macrophages are now going to the cell cycle. Um, just by being co-cultured with the CD4 positive T cells. I should say that the, you wash these cells, the CD4 cells off 
after a period of co-culture and this, the macrophages are stuck to the plate so they can't move. Um, we also uh, did what we call a polarization experiment. Um, you, uh, you may know that macrophages can be polarized into pro-inflammatory macrophages. This is a slight dogma and an oversimplification, but an M1 macrophage is generally um, the product of uh, you stimulating macrophages with the lipopolysaccharide um, uh, and interferon. Uh, and if you want to generate an M2 or a, an anti-inflammatory macrophage, you just you can use something like IL-4. Um, uh, uh, and so when we did, when we generated those kinds of macrophages, you can see that there isn't really a cell cycle signature um, suggesting that the macrophages that we're producing here by co-culture are radically different to any described groups of macrophages like M1, M2. So what's the proof that the contact is actually doing the thing? Because yeah, it could be, of course, secreted molecules. Um, well, we use a transwell system where you can put a barrier between your T cells and your macrophages. And when you put the barrier in here, you can see that the amount of cell, uh, the proportion of cells that are cycling uh, uh, is brought back down to, um, to, 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 to levels uh, that you find with um, cells on their own. So you can see here the co-culture situation gives you a tenfold increase in cycling cells, and that's almost completely blocked when you put the transwell, uh, the barrier there. So suggesting that there's a contact uh, requirement. Um, and this is proved by Western blot. You can see the transwell, when you put the blockade in, uh, you lose the, um, the cell cycle markers here, uh, uh, suggesting that that contact is critical. How does that translate to infection with HIV, um, GFP? Not sure what's happened there. Um, so we infect this with an HIV lentiviral ve vector. Um, and again, you can see that when the, 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 the macrophages are co-cultured with, with CD4 cells, they become very highly permissive to HIV by an order of magnitude. Again, consistent with the fact that you've deactivated the restriction factor in the, the macrophages. Um, so that's cell-cell contact. Again, of course, that can occur in lymph nodes and spleen. You know, the cells are very tightly packed in those situations. So you might imagine that that uh, happens in vivo. Uh, we also started wondering about oxygen levels because we do our culture experiments in, in room, room oxygen, 20% um, in, the, in the human body. Most oxygen, you only find 20% oxygen in, in the airways potentially. Everywhere else, you're looking at 1% to 5% oxygen. So, um, uh, so, of course, we wondered whether low oxygen could actually change cell cycle status. Um, here's a, just a bit of a complicated diagram about the, 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 the system of sensing oxygen in the body. Uh, you've all heard of uh, HIF, hypoxia inducible factor. Um, essentially, um, our body senses oxygen uh, through these things called pH, PhDs, which are um, enzymes that contain iron. And um, when they have oxygen on board, they um, hydroxylate a HIF. That hydroxylation um, enables the HIF to be recognized by um, uh, VHL, von hippel lindau uh, protein, and then destroys um, the, the HIF um, via the proteasome. Um, and that's in abundant levels of oxygen. Um, in low oxygen, um, this doesn't happen and HIF accumulates and that HIF then goes into the nucleus and it's a transcription factor. So it will then trigger a whole cell, a cell program of responses to low oxygen and that will culminate in EPO um, production, for example, in the kidney. So, um, so HIF, uh, there are two types of HIF, there's HIF1 and HIF2. Uh, they drive slightly different pro, pro transcriptional programs in the cell. Um, so what we did is we essentially tried to generate macrophages in normoxia or hypoxia, 1% versus 20%. Uh, you essentially take your monocytes, you culture them, you put them in low or higher, higher oxygen, uh, and then you look at them uh, after uh, eight days. What was quite remarkable is that we found that um, uh, if you, uh, uh, blue is, 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 is low oxygen, you can see here that the MCM2 is very highly reg upregulated, suggesting that um, the cells are in cell cycle. You've got expression of HIF1 and HIF2, as you'd expect uh, under low oxygen conditions. Uh, the CDK1, the cyclin associated with cell cycle is up. The phosphorylated SAMHD1 is up uh, and ERK, which is, the ERK, is also up. So this suggests that this pathway, this mitogen cell cycle pathway has been activated by low oxygen, um, which is quite surprising to be honest. We didn't really expect this to happen uh, in such a strong way. And for what, so looking at HIV, what happens here? You can see here the quantification. If you um, if you uh, uh, have uh, if you put the, the the cells in 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 low oxygen, uh, you get a higher infection. So hypoxia driving um, higher susceptibility of macrophages to infection with a GFP virus. 
Um, of course, SIV Mac uh, lentiviral particles, they carry VPX. So they shouldn't care whether you're in high or low oxygen. And indeed you don't, you get, um, uh, uh, you don't, you get a, you don't get the same uh, relationship. So you abrogate that, that increase in hypoxia consistent with the fact that SAMHD1 has been turned off. Um, so we found a couple of ways where cells can, kind of macrophages can go into cell cycle and increase permissivity to HIV um, and lenti particles at the pre-integration step. We're not saying anything about post-integration in these simple systems. Um, uh, uh, but you know, the next thing was whether we could find ways of closing that permissivity window. How do you how do you arrest cells in, essentially? Um, and what was interesting, um, probably not surprising, but any drug that's been developed for chemotherapy or tum treating tumors like HDAC inhibitors, uh, such as Saha, um, can induce a cell cycle arrest. You can see here that the the green dots represent infected cells. Uh, if you treat um, uh, uh, you, uh, this is sort of standard conditions um, uh, uh, in fetal calf serum, lots of infection. Uh, if you treat with Saha, you completely block infection. Uh, and if you knock out the SAMHD1 with uh, siRNA, uh, you restore the infection. In other words, the Saha is activating SAMHD as a restriction factor. Uh, you can show this by Western blot. Um, uh, if, you, uh, if you add uh, a Vernastat here or Saha, uh, you get a tenfold loss of infectivity of HIV uh, lenti particles. Um, and if you remove the SAMHD1 by sRNA in those macrophages, you can then restore and rescue that infection despite presence of the, um, of, of, of the cancer drug there. Um, uh, and the, the Western blots for the site, the cell associated markers match that very nicely. So, so um, uh, of course, we all know about HDAC inhibitors as latency reversal agents but actually they, they cause a block to HIV infection in, 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 in macrophages. Um, we also found that toposomerase inhibitors such as etoposide uh, um, uh, are able to cause cell cycle arrest. Of course, this is obvious because that's why they are anti-cancer drugs. You can, um, uh, you can detect genotoxic damage in macrophages, even though they're not dividing. You can stain for these things called gamma H2AX and 53 BP1. And you can see with the top side, you get speckling in the nucleus, suggesting that you've got DNA damage response going on. Um, and when you activate the DNA damage uh, um, pathway, uh, this leads to a cell cycle arrest. And you can see here that with the top side, you get a tenfold loss of infectivity of HIV um, uh, that you can completely restore um, uh, if, you, uh, if you knock out SAMHD1. So here you've got cells which uh, supporting high levels of HIV transduction, despite the fact that they've been exposed to like, you know, 10 micromolar of a toposide. So, you know, these cells don't die. They tolerate very high levels of, um, uh, of DNA damage uh, and, and yet can support a, an infection. Uh, and that's true down here for different viruses. You can see um, the lentiviruses are susceptible to a toposide and cell cycle arrest. HIV2 is not so susceptible because it encodes a VPX. SIV MAC again does not show a defect. Uh, that's why the black bar is so high because it has VPX. And of course, we've got different viruses like adenovirus, um, uh, an RNA virus here called Semliki forest virus. And then we've got HSV, a DNA virus. None of these are affected by, um, by treatment with a topicide. Um, so that's uh, genotoxic um, agents. We then got interested in LPS because of course LPS is our classic um, innate immune activator. Um, it's it's uh, contained in gram-negative bacteria, very potent uh, stimulus for our cells. We are hardwired to detect LPS and to respond to it, um, to prevent sepsis, presumably. And this is how LPS signaling works. It goes through TLR4, uh, which is very highly expressed on macrophages. Um, TLR4 will trigger two different pathways. One is dependent on MyD88, one is TRIF dependent. One will result in NF-kappa B um, activation and one is RF3 activator. Once you get uh, uh, those activations, those transcription factors will then generate interferon and interferon beta, for example, when will then find an, an interferon receptor on another neighboring cell and activate the JAK-STAT pathway for further ISG in, um, uh, induction. So this is how sort of you get amplification of inflammatory responses in, in macrophages, for example. So we were kind of curious as to see what LPS would do to cell cycle uh, regulation. Um, the obvious, I mean, it's, it's known, it's well known that interferon will arrest cells. So we know that, but um, what was interesting here is that when we treated our monocyte derived macrophages with LPS, uh, we got a, a, a sort of tenfold defect in HIV infection. 
we got a reduction in cell cycle associated proteins as we expect. Uh, and you can see that with, uh, with the RNA-seq. Um, uh, when you add LPS, you, uh, you, incre you, in you increase CXCL10 and MXA here, for example, and you, you get a radical reduction in these cell cycle proteins. So you're causing a cell arrest. That's why these are all blue, because they've all gone down. Um, so so L LPS is, is arresting cells, um, probably not surprising. What was surprising is the mechanism, because it's not a classical mechanism. Um, it's not dependent on MyD88. And what was nice is that the, 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 the pathways downstream of LPS can be dissected because, for example, TLR5 cannot, cannot activate um, uh, RF3. It has to activate MyD88, um, and it's, uh, it's detecting flagellin um, uh, 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 as it's, um, uh, it's a sense of a flagellin. So, um, so you can use flagellin, and you should get MyD88 activation. And when we did that... Um, uh, uh, we found that the, uh, the phosphosam didn't change and the, the amount of infection didn't change. So activating TLR5 doesn't cause a blocked infection. Activating with LPS TLR4 causes a huge defect in infection because of cell arrest. We are able to then use um, activate TLR4 in a slightly different way using something called tenacin. This is a molecule found, um, it's released when tissue is damaged. So What's interesting is that, and this is something that not many people know, um, is that TLR4 is actually a sensor for, for tissue damage. Like, so when you have a cut on your skin, you're actually activating TLR4, um, just not via the classical pathway, um, but you're actually activating one part of it. Uh, and tenacin, come back. Anyone? Oh. Maybe. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it now. <laughs> oh, there it is. Yeah, great. So um, you can activate TLR4 in a slightly different way uh, and not the whole thing. You can actually activate the, 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 the MyD88 side of TLR4, specifically with this tenacin protein, which is, as I say, uh, produced when you damage your tissues. Um, and if you use tenacin in this assay, you don't block uh, HIV infection at all um, uh, because, of course, it's not causing cell cycle arrest. So the cell cycle arrest that we're seeing with LPS here is, is probably acting somewhere down this side of the, um, uh, the mechanism, the TRIF, TBK1, and RF3. So we tried to take that apart a bit further um, using inhibitors. Uh, there's some nice drugs available for TBK1. Uh, so you can block this part of the pathway here. Uh, and if you do that, uh, uh, you still don't um, cause an arrest. So you can see BX, the BX drug is here. Um, uh, so, so it's suggesting that the, 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 the cell cycle arrest is happening upstream. So there's a, it's kind of a novel pathway where the TLR4 is activating a program. Uh, we think it's around TRIF, which is then causing a cell cycle arrest in response to lipopolysaccharide. So there's this danger mechanism or this alert mechanism that's not been described before uh, that we haven't fully dissected, but it's acting somewhere here. Um, this, uh, this figure just shows you that um, the cells are doing what they should do. Uh, this is a nuclear translocation assay uh, where you can detect RF3 or NF-kappa B in the nucleus um, following different um, uh, uh, stimuli and, and use of different drugs. So that's just a control to show that these, these, uh, these, these macrophages are uh, fully competent um, for RF3 and NF-kappa B uh, movement from the cytoplasm to the nucleus following activation of, of different aspects of TLR4. So just to summarize, um, we showed that macrophages can reversibly transition. I didn't show you the data, but th this is reversible. So you can, if you take the, the serum off, you, the, the macrophages will go back into G0. So there's a plastic, there's plasticity going on and, and it shows that the cells are not progressing through to cell division. Um, and there must be a reason, a physiological reason for this. We haven't quite figured out what that is yet, um, but there will be a reason why cells, macrophages are able to do this. We believe it might be around uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 anti the inflammatory effect, we believe that arrested cells are probably more pro, pro inflammatory, and um, cycling cells are probably anti inflammatory. But we haven't really kind of shown that conclusively yet. Um, and so we believe that macrophages are doing this because it changes their physiological properties. Um, the relevance for HIV is, of course, that that toggling if cell cycle transition. Uh, regulate SAMHD1, which is a which is a very strong restriction factor for HIV and myeloid cells. Well, we've shown that HIV has avoided the need to degrade SAMHD 
uh, because it just takes advantage of cell cycle fluctuations. And we can show um, that uh, arrest of um, uh, cells is a, is a response to danger signals, for example, bacterial products or genotoxic stress. Um, the relevance of what we showed was that, I guess, that cell, cell contact, uh, as found in lymph nodes, spleen, and gut, um, uh, can drive uh, susceptibility to HIV, and low oxygen, of course, can drive susceptibility to HIV infection. And so in, in sanctuary sites or what we, you know, replication sites uh, are likely to have permissive macrophages. And it would be very interesting for you guys um, who have tissue specimens to be looking at cell cycle markers in your, in your tissue specimens. And it would be great to see, um, see our data backed up in, 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 v, in vivo, as it were. Um, and I, the other interesting thing is that obviously we're all different and our genetics mean that some of us probably are more pro cell cycle than others. And we can see this because when we take donor macrophages or mon monocytes, we get huge variation. Like my, my cells one day may be super permissive to HIV. The next week they will be resistant to HIV and the FCS doesn't have the same effect. So there are probably epigenetic and genetic factors driving um, how, how susceptible our cells are to HIV. And this may contribute to variation between individuals and reservoir size and underlying inflammation you know, during, during ART. Um, and then finally, of course, we've shown that drugs um, uh, can have differential effects on the life cycle. So LPS and SAHA will arrest cells, but of course we know they are also latency reversal agents. So we may be able to leverage those dual um, activities uh, for curative um, interventions. So uh, with that, um, just like to acknowledge a whole group of people, my lab uh, and our funders. And um, thank you for listening. I'd like to take any questions. Hi, Ravi, that was terrific. <clears throat> um, it strikes me there's like, you, you describe this window of mm. where the macrophages are, are permissive. And, and it strikes me that the, the window must be very narrow um, in the context of HIV because um, the, um, in order for HIV to infect um, um, monocytes or macrophages, um, you know, you, you typically need to have um, a, 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 an HIV envelope uh, that mm. can infect um, low CD4 density yeah. uh, on the cell surface, right? Which is, which we often don't see. We often don't see those viruses emerge until later uh, in, in the disease course when there's already a, a, quite a lot of CD4 uh, yeah. depletion, um, yeah. uh, particularly in tissues. Uh, and so that's like one barrier. One of the things that the CD4s are, yeah, seem to be activating the cells into cell cycle, and then there's also microbial translocation, which um, uh, which is also worse in in, yeah. in advanced uh, disease. And it seems like it's a narrow window for the virus yeah. to um, uh, in, in, you know, to actually productively uh, you know infect uh, uh, macrophages. Yeah. What are how do you think it gets around all of yeah, those? Yeah, I, I think you made a really important point about macrophage uh, envelopes. Uh, so all the viruses we used here are uh, VSV pseudotypes. So they, they, they'll go into any cell. Um, the, I mean, we've done a lot of experiments with, uh, with transmitted founder viruses in the past, and they do infect macrophages. You, you know, you just may need more virus and, you know, you may need to wait. So I think that although there is a dogma out there about macrotropic envelopes being only occurring in late infection. I mean, I, I believe that actually a lot of viruses will be able to infect macrophages and you may only really need a few events, you know, probability wise, you may only need a few infection events because those macrophages are not going to die. They'll churn out virus for a long time. Uh, and so, um, I'm, uh, yeah, so I don't think there's um, that this, that what I'm showing here is necessarily only relevant for late stage HIV AIDS. I think this could be happening very early on uh, in the lymph nodes, spleen, gut, where you've got these this tight association. I mean that that figure I showed you here was it? Yeah, up top left. That's a that's a that's a tonsil from uh, a South African um, person living with HIV, and you can see that those red red is CD sixty eight. So it's the, the macrophages are really very nicely dispersed amongst all those T cells. To block, yeah. And it may be a, a site-specific thing. Yeah, yeah, it's very, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, but to, all of these, you have to integrate all these factors. And I, really, we have to look at the tissue to see what the truth is, right? Uh, uh, and that's why I think that's quite exciting. Tim, did you say? 
uh, in people that are both by reading but also from the other So, um, yeah, I, I agree with Peter. Obviously, there, there is going to be, you know, dynamics in terms of envelope uh, evolution, the four usage, two to our five changes, and then yeah. the right density. So, like, uh, the Kelly has their models in the past and things like that. So, I think, I think those all play a role, but we have been seeing it, and we're seeing it pretty much everywhere. Yeah. And so, uh, regardless of the mechanisms that seem to overcome that, seem to affect these cells, these cells seem to persist in this way. Yeah. So that's the, you know, that, that's just what the observation is. Um, yeah. And so, obviously, what this other mechanism is and how they're, they're, they're doing this uh, is, is also potentially, you know, and of course, you know, they try to make stuff with the eating speed of these cells that are infected and then becoming infected, which is also a potential possibility. Yeah. That Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, actually. Cell to cell transmission. I, was there a paper on this that kind of overcomes the the envelope um, tropism issue? Yeah. Yeah. Because you increase the density artificially, the, the virological synapse artificially increases your density of, of receptor, doesn't it? So that's a very good explanation for why a, a non macrotropic envelope can actually be quite effective at infecting macrophages if you increase the density. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right, and so they could be performing syntitia and yeah, it's interesting. Cool. Hi, Melanie. Hi. Great talk, Ravi. Um, I, went, I wondered whether this is only um, uh, applying to uh, bone marrow derived macrophages and what about York sac, you know, derived mm. macrophages? And I mean, maybe getting into the whole mm. discussion, wider discussion that you guys just had um, with Tim, um, I, I always wonder why the infection of, you know, especially the York sac derived macrophages are not keeping the virus in patients after bone marrow transplantation. So what is your yeah. thought about this? Thanks for that. Um, I mean, we did work with York sac derived macrophages. We did uh, we worked with microglia, which are York sac derived uh, in mice and in our first paper, we showed again, about 20% of those were in the cell cycle. Uh, so they were then very permissive to HIV when we infected them. Um, uh, and then the really key question you're asking is about um, uh, in stem cell transplant, how do we, yeah, how do we somehow deal with those reservoirs? So that's a kind of, I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I guess the conditioning regimen of the chemo potentially arrests cells and makes them refractory to infection. The ones that are already infected, I mean, could there be a graft versus infected cell effect there as we, do, we, we, we talk about T cells having that phenomenon? That the incoming allo, uh, cells will recognize the infected cells and kill them. Um, but if they're in the brain, that becomes a little bit harder to imagine. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer for that. The other thing to bear in mind, actually, is that, again, I talked about variation between individuals. And these studies of um, myeloid reservoirs, it's, they don't find myeloid infected cells in everybody. So there's, you know, they, they're finding it some some individuals and not others. So there may be host variation as to how permissive your macrophages are. Yes. Yeah, in vitro, these macrophages will live for weeks and will churn out virus the whole time. And I think from studies, macrophages are typically thought as long-lived cells. I did see a, a one study, though, that suggested they had a half-life around 30 days. So Again, as technology improves, I think we, we are kind of challenging some of these, these beliefs about, about macrophages. For example, that they don't divide. Well, they do, you know, they can proliferate even if they're yolk sac derived. And sometimes even if they're not yolk sac derived, they can proliferate. So, so I think we're learning more with, with, as technology improves. And, yeah. and we have a question on the Zoom. Um, are you able to distinguish engulfment of infected T cells by macrophages during in vitro infection in assays with CD4 T cells? When we use the, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, 
Well, we infect the macrophages after the contact. So we, we, we put the cells together, wash the cells off, and then infect the macrophages. So the T cells don't get the opportunity to be infected and therefore engulfed. So even if T cells were, were engulfed, uh, it wouldn't be an explanation for why the macrophages are infected. That makes sense. Thank you so much, Ravi. Um, that was great. And you have a series of people who really want to meet with you. Um, so great. we'll take you over to Pride Hall and show you up in a room. And thank you again. Thanks for very much for having me. Thank and you. seeing us, you were wonderful. That thank was you. great. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you.